And so here's the central transcontinental corridor. Again, we feed it from the east over again the Broadway route. And by timing the departure of the Zephyr and the Empire Builder type services for late afternoon or early evening, uh, the same Broadway schedule that brings you connecting services for the Southwest services can also connect over to the Empire Builder, which isn't shown here, or over to the Zephyr type services. On the Zephyr, uh, one of its weak points, and I know Amtrak thinks it's their strongest train, but it does have a couple of weak points. Namely, it's a single train which runs by some route, and as a Wyoming resident, we could argue about which route is better. The point is, it's a single train that takes some route. I heard it lately goes through Colorado. It doesn't matter where it goes. But it's a single train that goes out to Utah. Now, out to Utah, it carries reasonable loads. In fact, it probably pays its over-the-road expenses as far as Utah. But now you take a single train, and you divide it into three pieces, and I'd like somebody to tell me how long each of those pieces is at best. As far as I can figure out, each one is a third of a train. But it has a full train crew. But you're carrying only about a third of the load. So down here, we've got really some what you might call quasi-viable services across uh, Nevada and on up into Idaho. How do we cure that problem? What you do is you run a little thing that's better than a third of a train. If a third of a train isn't very good, try two-thirds of a train. It's a little bit better. And you bring two-thirds of a train down into the Utah hub. But two-thirds of a train, you can't split up into one train. But it splits up into two full-sentence trains. Those two full-size trains now head east over two different routes. But you say, aha, now you've got two routes, you've got two infrastructure costs. I think one of the things that John Messier wants to address is how do you pay for those stations out here? Does Amtrak own those stations? The answer is no, and John can address that. So your cost for those stations really shouldn't be charged against Amtrak if you can get them some other way. Okay, so two trains charge across here, one on the fast UP and one on the scenic, but not quite as fast, Rio Grande. When they arrive at Denver Union Station, they're separated by about four and a half or five hours, which is exactly what you want, because there's always been demand, and I know from my experience at Interrail, what the demand is, you know, usually exceeds the supply, for overnight service between here and the Midwest. So we depart two trains on slightly different schedules down the BN. The fast train gets to Omaha uh, fairly late at night, early morning, uh, and it's going to cross across the standard BN route through Ottumwa at its usual 2 in the morning or whatever it turns out to be, which means you don't serve these small communities down here very well. But it's sort of been traditional to serve them in the middle of the night, and you do do a certain amount of business there at 2 in the morning, strangely enough, okay? Uh, and so why confuse them? They've always had their train at 2 in the morning. Let's not give it to them at 2 in the afternoon. They might get a little confused. Anyway, the train gets into Chicago fairly early. The other train doesn't get to Omaha until it's about dawn. It takes the northern route across the Chicago Northwestern, where it goes through Boone and serving the much richer uh, terrain along the Chicago Northwestern route, so that you feed into the Zephyr from two different routes across here, and finally, of course, the fast train breaks down into all these branches here. You can also feed equipment across to Kansas City and then on up to Omaha, for instance, off a route that looks like um, the Cardinal or something like that, or a takeoff on the Cardinal. So there's all sorts of ways of feeding it. Finally, for the interest of Bill Hamilton, we identified an interesting market. Does anyone know how many airplane seats go from this region of Texas along that particular spine every day? The answer is about 20,000. So that's a major travel market. Has Amtrak ever looked at addressing part of that travel market? I mean, where do Texans go to ski? There aren't too many mountains in Texas. You know, love it. Okay, I mean, the old joke in New Mexico, what's the highest place in Texas? It's right next to the lowest place in New Mexico. But anyway, the point is, they go uh, out there into the mountains to ski. But does Amtrak address that problem? And they go out there in the mountains in the summer, too, when it's cooler up in the mountains. So there is a travel market along this route. How do you feed it? 
low octane types of services, up to the infamous Newton hub, and make Newton you know, well known on the national system, and then across the southwest transcontinental route, feeding into Denver, and connecting with the early train across the mountains, so they go up into the mountains, finally get into the hub, and the thing disappears on up toward Vancouver. Well, the cost ramifications of running that service on that particular line depends a little bit on what time of day it occurs, but you've already got those uh, that overhead in place. In fact, if you're going to serve Oklahoma with something like a uh, Lone Star type service, you're just doing this incrementally on top of an existing service. All right. In fact, there are some schedules we worked out where this train just happens to go through there right on the schedule of the Southwest. So you could in principal hall that is an extra bunch of cars to the southwest. The only additional hunk of track where the train runs by itself is up in here, um, just as an example. If you can't make the same schedule and for various marketing reasons, you might want to run it across here as its own train, which means you're really out just the cost of the train crew. Because if you're going to add four or five cars to an existing train, you're probably going to have an extra unit anyway. Whether it's end unit or not, it's going to depend on whether or not you have to pay for an extra front end crew. But if it's already an established route, it's just an incremental cost of running one more service out there across that particular single track piece of railroad. So depending a little bit on the schedules that you choose will determine your exact cost factors. So certain schedules are going to be a little more expensive, certain schedules are going to be a little cheaper. But the point is this looks like a major system of trains. It's really only three or four trains with a bunch of through cars. But the illusion you give the user is you, you can go anywhere. Look, you can go from down here up to Vancouver. You can go from LA to you know, Montreal if you want to do something as silly as that by train, but you could potentially do it. Plus, you've got all of these overlaying markets which make for a huge ridership matrix. The number of riders between any two points is always going to be small but the number of points you serve is going to be large, and that's why you get a reasonably large number of riders. By large number of riders, we mean increasing the ridership by the astronomical factor of about five or six over current levels, and increasing costs by a factor of about three, and therefore you go from about a 50 to 60% operating ratio to essentially breaking even. But what does that mean, increasing Amtrak's long distance ridership by a factor of six? It means you're going to carry, instead of a half a percent or less than a half a percent of the inner city traffic in this country, you're going to go up to about three percent. It's still not a major factor. It could still go away the next day and no one would really notice. But the point is, no one's going to care because you're not costing the taxpayers any money. So the system will be in place. It will serve those small communities that need it and it won't be a political hot potato, which is what we're trying to get to. Thanks, Adrian. I think, Russ, do we have a little time for questions? Okay, uh, we have uh, the three of us who spoke, Andreas, who works for the Chicago and Northwestern as a cost, and uh, that's Tubman, who's the, uh, not only the president of Interrail, uh, are also resource persons on the panel and will invite questions and concerns. This uh, whole plan would uh, seem to depend very much on tight adherence to schedules. Have you uh, looked at a, uh, a train breakdown or a, a schedule type breakdown in your computer model to see what effect that would have on the, the whole house falling down type thing? Well, okay. Essentially, if there's a major breakdown, you're going to have a uh, major annulments, okay? But look at what Southwest does. They uh, turn their equipment in about 10 minutes. But if it's not there, they simply annul the service. Now, that can, of course, upset the user. But the question is, how often is that going to occur? And, and what are your options?